Hello again and thank you for joining us for the second installment. Uh, my name is Davar Bhatt. I am the research manager at Legal Aid Society. Legal Aid Society works with various communities and particularly the Sindh government to suggest policy reform and uh, social legal reform which is intended to ameliorate the conditions of the religious communities living in the province. Uh, in this particular podcast, we will be discussing the single national curriculum, which has uh, at, at least been imposed in the federal uh, federal jurisdictions and also the Punjab province. And joining me again is Mr. Peter Jacob, who was a member of the uh, the committee to define the curriculum for religious education and is also a member of the National Curriculum, curriculum Council. So, uh, without further ado, uh, welcome Peter Saab. Kya hal chal aapke? Ji, thank you so much. Ji, my khariyat se. So, Peter Saab, uh, sabse pehle toh, I think the most important and relevant question here for all of us is that uh, we already have heard the concerns of various communities. And since you've been part of the curriculum council as well and you facilitated the designing of the curriculum, uh, do you see that the curriculum overall is balanced and equally representative of all communities or is in a sense especially the religious education subjects but also the compulsory subjects that they are inclusive or do you think that we need to do much more to have a curriculum that represents all the people of Pakistan? Uh, thank you so much for question Dava. This is a uh... The, let me explain that the subject of religious education uh, was brought in as alternative to Islamia because earlier uh, the minorities could the minority students could take up the subject of ethics, which was uh, not only discriminatory but there were practical operational problems that uh, forced them to study only Islamia. So more than eighty ninety percent of um, students belonging to minorities were forced to uh, study Islamiyat. So this subject was created for first five classes and there were five religions included. Students could opt for any of them. So uh, besides uh, Hinduism, Sikhism, uh, Kalashi, Baha'i and Christianity, uh, Sikhism, uh, they, they were uh, uh, proposed the curriculum was prepared and yes, uh, I was in the driving seat at that time and uh, it was proposed uh, but yet not implemented. Although the province of Punjab was very keen and eager, uh, rather hasty I must say they behaved, that uh, they adopted a, a single national curriculum uh, before any province uh, had a chance to review and comment on that. But they, they could not implement this, which is, again, I, I think uh, it's a lacking. Um, and that's why, uh, I mean, there is a confusion whether that religious studies, religious education has been implemented. When will it be implemented? Will, when will be the books ready, etc. Uh, on the other hand, um, the main issue here is that the all the compulsory subjects, um, even sometimes in mathematics and physics, the mention of uh, uh, mention of majority religion comes not as not only as you know kind of superior religion, which is again discriminatory, but uh, uh, it falls in the definition of religious instructions, uh, which is um, which is somehow. Uh, ultra virus under Article 22.1 of the Constitution of Pakistan. Um, therefore, uh, that is one side of uh, you know lacking. But Punjab uh, in past two years uh, has been uh, subject has been subjected to various experimentations. Uh, it looks like there are different political forces and and uh, the. Uh, coalition partners who are trying to take political mileage uh, by introducing uh, changes to education system. For instance, 
the Punjab Assembly uh, has made the role of ulama board, which is clerics, basically, with regard to reviewing the books printed by Punjab Textbook and Curriculum Board. So, for clerics belonging to different sects, they will inspect the material before it is approved for uh, publishing and teaching. Uh, that that was one thing. The governor of Punjab again went on to make uh, reading of Quran compulsory and examination uh, for the higher classes. That means that when you are you when you are uh, up to uh, class twelve, you will study Quran uh, in parts, and then also for the masters and PhD, uh, they will have to they study Quran and pass exams for. So, in a way, uh, the role of uh, religious education and madrasas has been increased. Uh, so, uh, that's something worrying. Uh, it seems that uh, there is a pol not only a policy vacuum, but a policy collusion. Again, the Lahore High Court um, last month, they made uh, it mandatory for the magistrates, district magistrates to visit schools and see if the Quranic education is being implemented or not. Now, uh, two weeks earlier, uh, a magistrate in Chinyot, uh, um, closed ordered to close down two schools because they were not fully in compliance. Uh, there was no, uh, the, no competent teacher to who could, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, teach Quran. That means only that half is a Quran, Qaris, they will be made part of uh, the teaching force uh, of the teacher's uh, team. So uh, that is like, you know, a policy confusion and collusion. Uh, the policy is conflicting. On one hand, the question is raised whether it is the role of the judiciary uh, to inspect schools. Oh, but the, even yesterday there was a discussion with the Punjab uh, government and we were suggesting that the Punjab government should seek injunction from the Supreme Court. They should challenge this uh, verdict uh, and appeal to the Supreme Court for, for, for clarity because that is confusing the role. Only because of religious zeal, uh, the province of Punjab has become uh, a laboratory uh, of you know very odd experiments and it is uh, damaging the education the province was doing earlier uh, much better vis-a-vis uh, -vis standard of education and now uh, whether it is government schools public schools or private schools or church-run schools there are some church-run schools also who will be obliged to teach Quran uh, whether they have competence or not and besides, you see the technical problems, operational problems, uh, it might create some, uh, some problems that, uh, that invite social unrest. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a very dangerous situation, I must say, and we are all talking about it to have something uh, resolved. So single national curriculum, on one hand, the complications uh, and I'm happy that at least uh, government has started realizing that there are complications. They have acknowledged the problems. The new director, Dr. Mariam Shuktai, has, uh, I met her personally and she's in communication. They are reviewing the policy framework while one province where it is um, under the uh, under different influences, I must say, religio-political parties and coalition government which is uh, which is not able to improve the governance and admission of schools yet uh, trying to take mileage by introducing more religiosity in the school environment it is a, that was a very comprehensive answer i think i would our audience would appreciate because you gave a very good summary of all the issues and why these are issues particularly how uh, it even has uh, elements that go against what are the protections defined by the constitution itself. 
I think one follow-up question that uh, I would like to do is that since you've already mentioned that these are Punjab specific issues and uh, the Punjab province in itself maybe has uh, it's since it's a coalition government they have to be answerable to multiple people and these are political influences creeping into the education system uh, what sort of recommendations if for example if you have to define a uh, curriculum and uh, especially curriculum for new modern subjects not just religious education what are the elements that you might include which will help bridge communal gaps instead of creating more what are briefly it doesn't need to be very comprehensive briefly what are the perhaps the five main uh five or four or five main interventions or recommendations you would put forward to any government on how to bridge communal gaps because we have a role to play especially educationists have a role to play that from the very start from public schooling and everywhere that we try getting communities closer together and perhaps education curriculums could be the way to do it what would be your recommendations in this regard uh, thank you uh, well, uh, I think, first of all, we have to have some clarity uh, of objectives. With regard to single national curriculum, I think uh, we have to admit, we should admit, that having a singular curriculum for the entire nation and variety of schools was fundamentally flawed idea. It has to have, in order to have inclusivity, the, 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 uh, the, the objective has to be uh, be about accepting diversity, diversity of in education also the languages, the the, the, the teaching style, methodologies, and of course uh, books. Uh, there cannot be one book uh, prescribed, and then uh, it should somehow the, the 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 people got eluded with the idea that this will create unity. Uh, well, not by denying diversity, you can create um, unity. So, clarity of objectives, even the sub-objectives, learning objectives, etc., need to be. If the objective is to, uh, you know, create uh, uh, love for the nation, uh, patriotism, it doesn't uh, sound nice to be call it nationalism. It doesn't sound nice to um, uh, underdefine or uh, keep it open to uh, and the national that, that vocabulary is somehow redundant. Secondly, we have to have some clarity about the roles. Now, while there is there is a policy review going on, on in Islamabad with representation from all over, uh, it doesn't look nice that Punjab Assembly should pass legislation uh, about education before it is complete in the centre. Uh, either they they can they they can exercise, but somehow uh, again I would set the example of Punjab, which has uh, exercised the powers under 18th Amendment selectively. They would uh, they, they they would uh, you know uh, uh, disregard the instruction about religious uh, studies, as I said, but then adopt uh, rest of the rest of the single national curriculum spontaneously that is a selective application and again you see it is not job of the assembly to basically draft a policy it is for the uh, policy makers to bring the draft and then uh, explain why why uh, that draft is uh, like that and then get assent or consent of uh, relevant ministries and then assembly it is not job of the judiciary to uh, make policy interventions. So uh, I think we have to have uh, some clarity with regard to roles because education is a big subject. Uh, it's a vast uh, area, it's a vast territory. You have you know, teachers training, uh, curriculum making, textbook, uh, then of course examination system. These are all elements involving millions of people and of course uh, hundreds of millions of uh, students and finally it is not curriculum we need an education policy uh, and that should cater for you know for all children and where constitution 
in Article 25A uh, uh, makes it, you know, make it makes it compulsory for every child between the age of uh, five and sixteen to receive a compulsory and free education. So our education should not be about you know teaching religion basically, but giving elementary, primary, higher secondary education. The, that will enable our children to compete um, uh, not only among us ourselves but also in the world in the field of knowledge uh, it goes without saying that we we, we see very dismal very uh, uh, disappointing uh, results when it comes to learning standards uh, a five grade student at our schools does not uh, have the capacity of grade three when it comes to doing mathematics and languages and skills um, uh, on the other hand we have uh, 22 million 22 million students out of schools dropouts so the education policy should cater for you know all those needs uh, rather than you see uh, trying to create a, a sense of success by merely making children read uh, a few uh, religious texts or religious lessons. Thank you, Peter Saab. I think those are some very good thoughts to leave this podcast with as well because in each and every issue that we see as a society, we have ideas and we have people who are rightly placed. It's just, I think, a matter of time and also uh, a policy window where we can perhaps create a more inclusive education policy which is linked to our curriculums and helps every child the same way and provides them the same opportunities in their future. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you again and hopefully can do this again. Take care. Thank you so much everyone for hearing us and keep connected.